All right. Psalm 12, not a very long psalm, but as we've seen with every other psalm going in this, uh, up to this point, packed full of great doctrine. Uh, we're starting a little bit later tonight, so I'm going to dig right in here. Psalm 12, verse number 1, the Bible says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. And this is something that I think that we can see, and I know I personally can relate to very much in the time that we live in today. We live in a time that I believe is, is the beginning of the, the great falling away, the great apostasy that's happening, and the return of Jesus Christ, I believe is going to happen probably within the next generation, within my lifetime at some point. I may be wrong about that, but it seems the way things are going that there's just a lot more wickedness upon the earth. The love of many seems to be waxing cold as the day continues. And what this psalm is, is it's, it's, the psalmist is, is calling out to the Lord, is saying, help, God, we need your help because the godly man ceaseth. The man that wants to live for the Lord, the man that, that lives according to the laws found in the Bible, the godly man, someone who's going to live a righteous life, Ceasing means they're stopping. Like, they, I don't see him anywhere. Where is the guy that's sold out for the Lord? Where is the guy that wants to serve the Lord with all of his heart? Where is the person of integrity? Where is the person that wants to obey and follow God's instructions as opposed to just follow their heart and follow the lusts of their heart and just their, their desires and go off and just do whatever feels good? The godly man sees it. The faithful. What does faithful mean? Reliable. Dependable. People you can trust. People you can count on. The faithful fail from among the children of men. We live in a society today where people don't care that much about integrity. And what does that mean? About being a person of your word. When you say something, you actually mean it. I mean, we see that's evidenced by the divorce rates. People who make vows saying, no, it's until death do us part, and then just breaking up, getting a divorce for all kinds of reasons, just whatever. I'm just, I'm not happy with you now. I've been, we've had a rough couple of years. Let's just call it quits. Let's just break our word. Let's just break our vows that we made before God. The faithful fail from among the children of men. It's hard to find people to even faithfully go to a church, faithfully follow the Lord, be dependable, be reliable. This is something that I think is just increasing and continuing to increase. We need help from the Lord. God, help us. Help us to, to preach your word and, and preach it uncensored. Lord, help us to be the godly examples so we could spark the fire in other believers and help them to become more faithful, to become more godly. Help, Lord. Verse number two, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. And what is vanity? Vanity means something that's pretty much useless, worthless, good for nothing. When I read this verse, one of the things that pops in my head right away is that you have a lot of believers out there, a lot of Christians that they're not talking about the things that matter. They're not talking about the things of God. They're not talking about the things that really have an, an impact or really have any value in this world. But what they're focused on rather is, hey, did you catch a football game? Hey, you see that basketball game? You see that baseball game? You know, it's talking about games and sports and things that doesn't matter. I grew up loving sports, and I still love sports. I like playing sports. I haven't played sports in a long time, but I grew up from Chicago. You know, I'm a big Bears fan, Bulls fan, all that stuff. But you know what? When the Cubs won the World Series recently after like over 100 years, it doesn't matter. It seemed to have mattered to a lot of people, right? And they probably remember that. Oh, man, they won the World Series. And you know what? They didn't win again. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Whether they won or not, who really cares? And most importantly, do you think God cares? That a bunch of grown men can go out there with a stick and a ball and see who can hit it the farthest and throw it the fastest and, and who can score the most points. It doesn't matter. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's sinful to go and play a game every once in a while or to blow off some steam, relieve some stress and go and do that. Fine. You could go watch a game. I'm not saying that's sinful either, but what this is talking about is people just speaking vanity with his, everyone with his neighbor. The godly man ceasing. 
The faithful are failing from their children, and all they do is getting caught up in just a whole bunch of worldly nonsense that doesn't matter. We need to keep ourselves in check with how we spend our time, where are our minds at, what are the things that we're talking about. Are we talking about things that matter, or is it our whole life just full of meaningless, empty conversations like, wow, it's kind of warm today. Well, it's a little bit cold today. Well, it's a little rainy. It doesn't matter. And again, you know, get what I'm saying here. I'm not trying to say every time you say something like that, it's a sin or, or wrong. But is that what your whole life consists of? Is that what you talk about just all the time? Is it completely worthless and meaningless? Because this is what's being described here. They speak vanity, everyone with this neighbor. And then he starts to get a little bit worse. He says, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. This is a lot worse than just speaking things that don't matter. Flattering lips, what are you doing? You're lifting people up and, and giving compliments way more than you ought to and for a purpose of, of doing evil to that person. That's what flattery does, is, is you're, you're lifting someone up to almost like an idolatrous level. And every time you see flattery in the Bible, watch out. Because behind that, there's the adulterous woman who flatters with her lips that tries to set the trap for the unsuspecting man who loves to receive praise and just this, this adulterous woman comes along and flatters and flatters and flatters trying to break down his defense to commit adultery and to do evil and wickedness, hunting for the precious life. We went over that about a week or so ago. Or, you know, it may not be the adulterous woman, it might be some other person trying to, trying to flatter you and deceive you and con you in some other way. Flattering lips with a double heart. Right, a double heart means they're saying one thing that sounds real good, but their heart's split. They don't really, that's not a genuine flattery. It's not a genuine compliment. It's not genuine what they're saying. They actually have ulterior motives. They have a double heart. Verse number three, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Praise God, right? We have a God that, that does right the wrongs. We have a God of judgment and justice. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Verse number four, who have said, this is the people now that are speaking these proud things. They're lifted up with pride. They're saying, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And that, that really just magnifies the pride of these people. Well, who's Lord over us? I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I'm going to actually prevail with the words that I use. I'm going to win. Who's Lord over us? There is a Lord over us. And God help you if you're a believer and you get caught up into this type of an attitude just saying, well, who's the boss over me? There is a boss over you. You need to watch what you say. You ought to be faithful. You ought to be godly. And you ought not to be using this flattery and a double heart to do evil upon people. Verse number five, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now it's talking about people who are, you know, oppressing poor people. The needy being, being, you know, the sighing of the needy means that the poor people who are being oppressed are crying out to God. They're, they're, they're being inundated. They're being overwhelmed with being persecuted. And God hears that. God hears their prayers. God sees the oppression. And he says, now will I arise. He's saying, I've had enough. Because God's going to stand in and step up for the, the poor of this world, for the people who get persecuted. He's always been like that. He's always taken the underdog. He's always taken those who are helpless or defenseless to step in and to show his strong arm and his might. When he chose the children of Israel, they, were, they didn't choose them because they were the greatest people in the world. When he chose to build a nation out of them, they were the smallest people. And that's why he chose them. And you'll notice when they go through oppression and when they turn to God and they get right throughout their history as a nation, that's when God steps in. He hears their prayers. He hears them being persecuted. And when they've turned to him, he steps up to the bat for them. And he defends them. And he rescues and saves his people. Just as he's doing here, verse number five, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. 
God will, will protect, and we see that throughout all, almost all the Psalms, is a common theme of God being our defender, our shield, our rock, our defense, that we can trust in the Lord no matter what's going on around us, no matter how desperate your situation seems to be, God will step in for you. Verse number six, I know I'm going through this kind of quickly because I actually want to spend the most of my time tonight in verses six and seven. The Bible says in verse number six, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. God's words, and, and what this is doing is illustrating, when you are refining metal, when you're refining you know, silver, gold, anything like that, it goes through a process of purification. So what they do is they, they take your, you know, when people mine, let's take silver, for example. They mine silver out, out of the rocks, right? They go, they, they dig it out. You've got rock that's full of other sediments and you've got silver and the way that they get that silver out is they heat it up so that the silver could melt and you're left with a much more pure form than what you started with because they're able to, to scoop out and filter out the, the stuff that's not valuable, the stuff that's not, not silver. As you heat these things up, just chemically, they've got different densities and things and you could, you could um, separate them. So what this is talking about is a, a form of refining seven times. So you keep on going through that process. After seven times of heating it up, filtering out the dross, filtering out all the worthless stuff, you've got a very, 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 very pure result. And that's what God's word is being compared to as this process of being refined seven times. Silver that's refined seven times, you're going to say is like 100% silver. It's going to be pure. So no matter how many times you go after that, you're not going to be able to remove any more impurities or any more imperfections. It's gotten to this level where, yeah, you know what, that's good. We don't need to continue on trying to purify. And the Bible is relating that to God's word. God's words are pure. They're perfect. They're, they're not corrupted. They're, they're, they're right. They're true. They're life. All of these are attributes of God's word. They're pure. So that's why, you know, I don't mind using words that are Bible words. Sometimes I go out soul winning. I've had someone, you know, try to cover the ears of their child when I said the word hell. Because they think that it's a curse word. Because it's used, I mean, it is a curse to go to hell. But it's not a bad word. It's not a swear word. Right? And, and we shouldn't treat the words in the Bible that even if today's society, which today's society is allowing for way worse things are becoming acceptable in the language that we use. But we never ought to look at a word that's in the Bible as being a bad or impure word because the Bible says that all the words of the Lord are pure words. So if you see the word bastard or you see the word hell or you see these words that people might look at and say, oh, that's a, a bad word. Not if it's in God's word. Now we shouldn't go around abusing the words and using them just in, in ways that, that is not really intended. I don't think we should be doing that. But we need to just have the proper understanding that, you know, hey, God's words are pure words. And we're going to go into this a little bit more. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. It's referring back to his words. That's the object here in verse number six. Was uh, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And I have this verse highlighted in my Bible. This is a Bible, the same Bible I used to go out soul winning. I like highlighting certain verses because it points out to the person I'm talking to, the point I'm trying to get across, it kind of draws their attention to it. Um, if you have a highlighter, you like doing it, you don't mind doing that at your Bible, I would recommend highlighting this verse because it doesn't come up all the time, but it's a very important subject to let people know that they can have confidence in God's word. A lot of people are wary and they don't know if they can trust the Bible because they think, oh, well, it's so old. You know, it's been copied so many times. And, and people will say this has been translated so many times. And it hasn't been translated that many times, actually. It, it really hasn't. Be careful with the words that you use. You want to use accurate terminology. The English Bible has only been translated once for all intents and purposes. It's translated from the languages that it was originally written down in. It's translated from Hebrew. It's translated from Greek. That's one translation. That's just going from, you know, from, from one language to another. It's been copied many, many times. So the, the original languages, if you will, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew, and even the English has been copied multiple times and, and you know, to carry forward into the future because 
Books are physical objects that, that deteriorate and you need to be replacing them with new ones because over use and time, they're going to be destroyed. I mean, this is, this is a great example of usage that comes with God's word where it might be time to start thinking about replacing that with another copy. The copy is going to contain the same words. It's just another copy. Now, we're going we're gonna to focus the majority of the sermon tonight on this important subject. I haven't touched this in a while. I knew we were coming up to Psalm 12. And this is extremely important to understand that in verse number 7 here, God is the one who is tasked with preserving his words. He did not just say, okay, I'm giving you my words one time. Now, good luck trying to keep that going forward into the future. If that were the case, because what people like to do is bring up this argument and say, well, it's proven that you can't just keep copying things without human error, without people, you know, just making mistakes and screwing up. And if you start with one thing and you start copying it, you know, it's kind of like the telephone game they play, right? Where you start with one person saying one thing and you keep on saying it over and over and over. And at the end, you know, you come out with something completely different than what you started with. There is a level of truth to that in a sense. Okay, there, there is some truth to that concept. Now, that particular game does not demonstrate the, the care given to copying the Word of God. Right? It's not, the it's not even the same thing to compare copying another book to copying the Word of God. I'm not saying that people still haven't made mistakes along the way in doing a copy of the Word of God. What I'm saying, though, is that if you were tasked and, you know, the printing press didn't exist and your job was to copy God's word and the scribes are the people who did that and they treated it as such. They weren't just like applying for a job. Okay, I'll just be a copyist. They clock in, they clock out and no, we're just going to do this job and they don't really care that much. These are people who actually were learning God's word. They cared about God's word and they wanted to preserve God's word so they would make these copies. Now, it still is possible to introduce errors that way, but one of the reasons why we can be sure that even after all of those copies are made, that God's word is still preserved is because the Bible says that he's going to keep his words. He's going to make sure that they are preserved. As much as he gave us his words to the, the original people, the original men of God that spake, whether that be Moses or David or Solomon or whoever it is that's being used of God to speak his words, he is also the one preserving them for us throughout time. And that's why it says, from this generation forever. That's the promise that's made. He says, from right now. Now, from now, when this word is being given to you, God's word is given, you have it right now, and you will have it forever from this generation going forward. The starting point is now, and it's going to continue on forever. That's a great promise. And this is coming directly from God's word. Now, um, turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. People have always been trying to corrupt God's word. Which is another thing that can cause people to doubt and try to question God's word. Is this really accurate? Can I trust the Bible? I mean, there's a, what about people who go around trying to pervert or to corrupt God's word? Well, we know that this was happening all the way back in the days, excuse me, of, of the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 17. And I'm going to try to get through material quickly tonight. If you have one of these bulletins on the back, I have a place for sermon notes. If you want to copy down or just write a reference to any verse that stands out to you, I encourage you to do so. There should be a couple pens in the back if you need one. But um, there's a lot of places we're going to turn to tonight and, and some places I won't even have you turn. So if you want to just make notes, feel free to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 17 is one of those places. The Bible says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God speak we in Christ. So he was saying, there's a lot of people, there's many people at that time, he's saying, that corrupt the word of God. They're trying to change it. They're adding to it. They're removing from it. There are people trying to corrupt God's word. And this was happening in their day. Knowing that that's the case, wouldn't you think that they would probably take even more effort to make sure that they're preserving it because they care about it, because they know that these people exist, they can't be very flippant with it. 
knowing that there are plenty of people out there trying to corrupt God's word. People have been trying to corrupt God's word going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When you have the serpent in the garden saying, yea, hath God said, and just causing Eve to question God's word, and then he changes God's word. He said, well, you shall not surely die. Well, actually, God did say that you shall surely die. In the day that thou eatest of, thou shalt surely die. And Satan comes along and corrupts it and twists and changes it and says the exact opposite. Well, you're not really going to die. Actually, you will. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, look at this, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So what was happening? People were writing letters and, assume, you know, and, and trying to convince people that they were coming from one of the apostles. So it's coming from Peter, it's coming from Paul, that they're the ones actually writing these. And we know, again, that this is evidence. Turn, if you would, to chapter 3. Because the Apostle Paul had a way of signing off on all of his epistles to make sure that people knew this really is legit. This is actually coming from the Apostle Paul himself. Because what many of the people did at this time, and you'll see this as you read the various books, especially in the New Testament, is that one person would speak like the author, you know, the human author of the book, whether it be Paul or Peter or someone else, they would orate, they would speak, and another person would write down what they're saying. So you'll see, like, I, Tertius, wrote this epistle, but Tertius isn't the one who came up with it, the words. He was writing as he was instructed by whoever was doing the speaking. Uh, you'll see that in many examples. But we see here in chapter 3, look at verse number 14, the Bible says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. And I just want to point this out. He's obviously using his word, his epistle, as it's the word of God, that this is scripture that's being given to them. He knows this. And we're going to get into that point a little bit. I just want to point that out because this is another reference of that. So he's saying, look, if, if any man's not going to obey what we're writing to you by this epistle, he says, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed because he says, you yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Verse 17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. So he's saying, this is the token. This is what I always do in all of my epistles. He writes with his own hand. He signs off so that you can see the handwriting of Paul, and he would always use a very similar phrase or something. You know, the, the, um, the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Or the Lord be with you all. He, he wrote these things at the bottom so that they would know this is actually coming directly from the Apostle Paul. And he was good at putting his stamp, if you were his signature on, he's signing his name to what's being given. Why? Because there were many people out trying to deceive and this was happening over and over again. And it's one of the devil's best tricks to get people not to believe. If you don't feel confident in this right, I mean, how else are you really going to know about Jesus Christ other than looking to the words of this book? We base our faith, I base everything that I believe on based on what's written in this book. If there's traditions, if there's customs, if things that have been passed down from time to time, if there are things that are inherently Baptist, that all the Baptists do this, but I find something in this book that's different than what everyone else is doing, if I'm going to be true, I need to be true to this book, to God's word and not to my own words. So that being said, I better make sure I have the right book. That if I'm going to rely on a source to, to give me everything that I need to know about belief and faith in God and how I'm to live my life, I need to make sure it's right. And if you can't be sure of that, and if people are, are, are shaken up about this, and they, well, I don't know what to believe, it, it, it makes sense to say, well, if this is changed and this is changed and this is changed, then how do I know what I really do need to do to be saved? How do I know what Jesus actually did? And that is, that is where, you know, like I preached last week, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And Satan's been attacking this foundation of the word of God for all time. Because he doesn't want people to hear the truth. He doesn't want people to be saved or have confidence in God's word. 
But we could have confidence in God's word, even though all this is happening, even though all the attacks have been happening. The reason why they're not successful is because God is the one preserving them. God makes sure that his word will, will be preserved from generation to generation to generation. The King James Bible, turn if you would to, where do I want you to turn? Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter 3. The King James Bible, the translation that we have in English, itself went through a purification process. When this was translated, it was really more of a revision. It was based off of the work of people that have come before the translators like William Tyndale and other versions of the Bible that, that, that came along after that kind of perfecting and improving on what was there before. Now, that does, but that does not mean that the words were not already preserved. See, people have these straw men arguments. So we're King James only. We believe that this is the Word of God. The King James Bible is the Word of God. We have it. It's perfect. It's preserved. It's without error. There are no mistakes in this book because God has preserved it. And what people want to do is say, oh, well, you know, so that means that the, the Tyndale Bible is just no good. It's just junk or whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll go back to some of his earlier versions. Well, where was the Bible before 1611, huh? Where was it, huh? You know, and they, they want to say these things to try to, to shake your faith and not have confidence in the fact that we can know that God's preserved his word for us today. Now, God did preserve all of his words. They haven't always been bound in one collection, completed 100% in all time. I mean, it, it only makes sense. You think about this. When God spake to Moses... First, he spake to him. Then it had to be written. Then it had to be carried through, right? And as these books become collected, by the time of Jesus, they had an entire Old Testament, right? Written in Hebrew. They had gone through the process over the years of, of new revelations being given, new things, you know, um, new words from the Lord being given, written down and transferred and then collected. Well, at the time of Christ, you go through the same process because then you have the first, let's just say, 100 years, Okay, it's less than 100 years. Let's just say the first 100 years, you've got people still receiving revelation. You've got John, you've got Peter, you've got Paul, right, writing these epistles. Well, all the churches at the time of Paul didn't have all of the writings all at their disposal, all in one place, all in one book, right? Making copies wasn't the easiest of things to do. It wasn't super difficult, but it wasn't that easy. It's not like today. You know, they didn't have a printing press. It had to be hand copied. But one of the things that they were told is that they were to share the epistles between the churches. This is how the collections came to be. This is how the Bible started to be formed. And people want to say, oh, you know, the Catholic Church, the Council of Nicaea, they're the ones who determine what's, what's canon and what's in the Bible. What's not. They're not the ones that determine it. The churches of God, the people who actually believe in Jesus Christ, the true believers are the ones who were maintaining that word and distributing them among all the other churches so that they can gather and collect all those books together. Now, the amount of time that it takes to get everything together, it's, it's, it doesn't change the fact that God's word is, has still been preserved and continued on throughout the ages. It's not like, you see, some people will, will make this argument that I do not agree with, that the King James Bible is inspired. The word inspired means God breathed. I do not believe that the King James Bible, by that definition, is inspired because the inspiration came from the original men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That is the actual inspiration where the men are speaking God's word. They are inspired by God. But that doesn't mean that I believe that the King James Bible is, is, has errors or fallible in any way because what it's been has been preserved. So the original speaking is the original inspiration. That inspiration took place and is real, but we didn't lose that original inspiration. It simply has been preserved throughout time. And there is nothing, and the reason why I say it is because when some people say in, that this is inspired, some people actually have the belief that this improves 
upon the original as if it's better than Greek or Hebrew or whatever is translated from that this is actually even better and improved upon. I don't believe that because I believe the originals had the perfect preserved word of God, the inspired words of God, and that they have just been preserved and then preserved through another language that it's, that it's continuing on to this day. Now, um, the promise that God, is that God's words are preserved. The promise is not made to the collection of those words into one book. Because people say, well, where was, where was that perfect collection of all the books in the Bible before the King James Bible? It doesn't even have to have existed, but all the words have. And they were being used by the churches that existed. They didn't all have to be bound into one printed material in order to be preserved and to be in existence and not just hidden under some rock, but actually being used in various churches. Now, um, the collection took place over time and were accepted by the various believing churches. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is to lead us into all truth. There is a way for believers to know if what they're reading is from God or not. When you pick up a, one of these, these modern pieces of trash and you compare it to these words, Side by side, you can tell, if you're born again, you should be able to tell pretty easily which one is from God and which one is not. It doesn't take that much. As a new believer, not having known anybody, this, as soon as someone just told me about this, it made perfect sense. Well, yeah, of course. When you have books that are saying different things and contradicting even to the point of just saying opposite things, they're not both coming from God. There's problems somewhere. And when you can see that the way that some of these books are written, it doesn't make sense at all. Now, before you're saved, this book isn't going to make any sense at all. The Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. But once you're a believer, th this book is opened up to you. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you and guide you in all truth and wisdom. So one of the reasons why we could have faith in God's word being preserved is just through the preservation of the churches that have received God's word. Um, so some examples that we see of the churches sharing the epistles that were given is actually also found in Scripture. Colossians 4.16 says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So when you get this epistle, make sure that the church of the Laodiceans also get this epistle. That they're also receiving of this. And then he says, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So they're sharing back and forth these epistles that are being written. Now, they have to span distances. It takes time to share this stuff. It takes time to copy it, right? So you, you can't expect to have everything all done just right away and perfectly preserved. But notice, I want to notice one thing about the language also. And I'm going to be going around and around in my notes, but that's fine. Um, the, the languages that God used to preserve his words or to give his words in, they're not some special language. We start off with Hebrew. Why was Hebrew used? Well, because that he was speaking to the nation that he was using as his lighthouse, the nation of Israel, and the language that they spake was Hebrew. It makes perfect sense that he used Hebrew to speak to his, excuse me, to his people. And just because the Old Testament was, was given and written down in Hebrew doesn't mean that it wasn't translated even at that time into other languages for other people to, to hear about. But the way it was given was in Hebrew. Well, we jump to the New Testament, and we have some in Aramaic, but mostly in Greek. Why was Greek used? Because that was the common language at the time. That was the language even that the, that the Jews were using. Yes, they used some Hebrew, but the common language of the day and of the time was Greek. So that makes perfect sense. And if you're thinking about, well, why, why, is the, why do you believe, you know, why, do, why are there problems in some of these other languages? And you think that, you know, why would God just treat English? Is English some special language? Well, English isn't a special language in and of itself, but doesn't it make sense if God is going to preserve his word in a language, he doesn't promise that it will be preserved perfectly without error in every single language that exists on the earth, but he promised to preserve it, right? Now, I believe that there is enough scripture in every language of the earth for people to get saved by, and, and that, is, that is perfectly preserved, but maybe not every single verse or every single aspect of it. But 
it would make sense when we look back on history and you see probably more than at any other time in the history of the world how much God's word has been used in English by English-speaking people to send missionaries out to the whole world and for his word to be spread. And just prior to the invention of the printing press, which I think God knew that that was going to happen, I don't think he was ignorant of that fact that that was going to come along. And then you look at, at how much time and detail was spent into that and that the heart of the king was moved to create this translation and all these resources were given to, to purify the word of God in the English language. Uh, you could probably liken that to as silver purified in the furnace of earth seven times. That the process that went through, the scrutiny, the scholarship, everything that went into this version of the Bible or translation of the Bible is unlike any other. It is unique. And the, the work speaks for itself. Did I have you turn to, to 2 Peter? Or no, where did I have you turn to? 2 Peter chapter 3. So, um, yeah, another example of them of the churches reading the other epistles. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. So the, the commands are being given. You know, use it, you read these epistles in other places. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom give, given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, what I want to point out about this passage here is that this is Peter writing his epistle, and he's speaking about the epistles of Paul, and he's saying some of the things in the epistles of Paul, they're hard to be understood. They're not all easy, right? It's not all milk of the word. He's writing some, some pretty heavy doctrine. But what he's saying is that the people who are ignorant, they're unlearned, they're unstable, they rest it, they twist it, they confuse it, they don't understand it. He says, even as they do also the other scriptures. So what Peter's doing here is attributing the epistles of Paul to being scripture. And what is scripture? Scripture is the written word of God. So we have inspiration, which means God breathed, where um, I have a bunch of, of scriptures on that, but I think I'm just going to pass through that. If you want to look at those, you can look at Hebrews chapter 1, and then in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is where the inspiration come from, where the God breathed, where the men of God spake as they were moved, and then it was written down. And that, that is scripture. Scripture, turn if you go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. There's a lot of references to the scripture. And just, you know, you could look this up on your own. Do a little word study in the Bible when the word scripture is used. And you'll see that it's not just talking about any writings. Because technically you can say scripture, you know, the word script. Postscript comes something that you write at the end of a letter. Um, script is just a writing. So you can say, well, Scripture is just writing, but in the Bible it's used to refer to God's Word. And you'll notice that all throughout the New Testament it's saying, and the Scripture was fulfilled, which said, and the Scripture was fulfilled, over and over, the Scripture was fulfilled, the Scripture was fulfilled. That is the most common usage of the word Scripture that you're going to find. Because it's God's Word being referred to that was written down, and something that Jesus did, or something that else that happened that fulfilled what happened, what was written down in the Scripture. So we have uh, Peter referring to Paul's epistles as being scripture, giving validity to that is being the word of God. And of course, they knew this at that time, which is why they shared it all, which is why they were collecting these writings and moving forward. And the Bible, the King James Bible is what, the Greek that it's based off of, it's called the Textus Receptus, which just literally means received text. And that is the vast majority of the manuscript are, are come from what's this collection that's known as the received text. And received text is what has been received by believing churches. That's literally what it means because we put our confidence and faith not in the, necessarily this full paper trail going all the way back or what the oldest manuscript is that's dug up, you know, over a thousand years later. We give more credence 
to the fact that believing churches have received this as being scripture and, and that that chain has continued, even if you don't have all of the details on that. You don't have to be able to trace back every single church, but it has been received. It's been distributed as being the truth. And the, the manuscripts that have been corrupted, as people have been trying to do throughout time, yeah, they still exist. You're going to find them in the wastebasket, like they did with Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. These other manuscripts, and, and you know, if, if you're familiar with the, with the King James only stuff, you'll know what I'm talking about. These are just other manuscripts that literally are like found under a rock, found in a wastebasket. They were garbage. They weren't being used. They, but yet that is the source text for many of the modern versions. Why? Because they're old. Just because they're old. Or because Satan has his hand in it, or both. We use the received text, what, what the churches have received, that's where the, the, the translation has come from. Um, turn, if you would, I, to 2 Peter chapter 1, if I didn't already... Oh, no, you're, no, never mind, never mind. 2 Timothy 3, right? Okay, I skipped that point. 2 Timothy 3, stay there. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Again, that word scripture being used here um, as, as referring to God's word. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's that word inspiration. Paul's words were inspired of God, and when it's written down, it becomes scripture. The Bible says here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Jesus Christ said that the scripture cannot be broken. In John 10, 35, he said, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Why can't it be broken? Because if it's scripture, it came from holy men of God, that spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost, it was written down and then preserved. Jesus is referring to the Word of God being preserved, being Scripture that can't be broken in His time that He was here on this earth. Now, 2,000 years ago for us is when Jesus Christ was on this earth, but how long has it been since the words that He was referring to were written down? Another couple thousand years, right? Easily. So, in relation to the New Testament with us, it was relative with Jesus and the Old Testament at his time of how old some of those scriptures were that, were, that he was using and referring to as being scripture, yet he had no problem, no problem referring to it as scripture, as holy, as the word of God as something that we can rely on. In fact, Jesus Christ himself, when confronted by the devil, said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That was his answer when, when the devil told him to turn you know, a stone into bread. He said, hey, you know what? We don't need bread. We need to live by every word of God. Now, would Jesus say something that we need to do if it was impossible to do or impossible to have? We can't have every word of God. Well, he thought it was. How can we live by every word of God if we don't even have every word of God? And that quote that he gave them is actually from the Old Testament. We look at that as a New Testament reference of something that's not quite as old. It's only a couple thousand years old. He was quoting from Isaiah 30. Or excuse me, not from Isaiah 30. He's quoting from Deuteronomy. And I don't have the, the reference in here. Oh, there it is. Deuteronomy 8. Verse number three says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou know, knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. God was teaching that to the children of Israel when he fed them with manna in the wilderness. Jesus Christ repeated that same exact phrase as being scripture unto Satan, saying this is what God said. God said it. Otherwise, if God didn't say that, then Jesus was lying.
It's preserved. It was preserved back then in Jesus' day. It's still preserved even today. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to John chapter 1. I want you to see this. We're going to look at John 1 and Matthew 17. There's an argument I want to debunk real quick that people will use about the preservation of God's word, and they'll say, well, and, and if you have a Bible that has this, some of them do, some of them don't. I've got a Cambridge Bible, and you can read this for yourself. There's a message from the translators right in the beginning of the book. Some Bibles have them, some don't. Uh, mine has it, and if you want to look at it after the service, you're more than welcome to. I'll show it to you. And basically, if you read it, they're, you know, they're, they're kind of being real humble. They're writing this letter to, the, to King James because he's the one that authorized this work. And they're you know, kind of saying how they... They worked on this and they put their effort into it, but they're, they're the ones that are going to claim that it's not, you know, that they don't claim for it to be perfect, that it's just another work. They, you know, they did their best and they're being real humble about the work that they did. And people point to that and say, see, the, even the King James but translators weren't King James only, right? Well, that's fine and they didn't have to be. You know what? I'll go with as far as they did. Maybe they weren't even saved. But that's not a problem for me. And I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to show you a couple things real quick from Scripture. A person being used of God and actually speaking God's word doesn't necessarily have to know that he is speaking God's word. He doesn't have to know that what he's saying is inerrant at the time that he's saying it in order for it to be inerrant in God's word. We saw examples where Peter is referring to Paul's epistles as being Scripture where he did know that, yes, these are, this is Scripture. This is from the Word of God. And he did know that, but that's not always the case. John chapter 1, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And this is talking about John the Baptist. So the Pharisees are asking him, Who are you? You know, because he's out in the wilderness, he's preaching, he's baptizing, he's doing all this stuff, he's making a big stir. And the Pharisees hear about this and saying, well, who are you? And he confessed and denied not, verse 20, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He's trying to make sure it's known. Hey, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. It's not me. But he says, and they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. So the prophecy of the scripture is that Elijah is going to come before Christ comes. So now they're asking, okay, well, if you're not Christ, are you Elijah? And Elias is just the, the Greek way of, of saying Elijah. It's the same name. And he answers them and he says, no, I am not Elijah. Now, turn if you would to Matthew 17. And when he answers them, he, sa he basically quotes Isaiah. He says, I am the, the voice of one crying in the wilderness Make straight the, the way of the Lord, as, a, as said the prophet Isaiah. Matthew 17, though, we're going to see what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Because when John was asked, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not that prophet. Matthew 17, look at verse number 10, the Bible says, and his disciples asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? So now they're asking about this. Why, why is it? Why does Elijah have to come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. He's already come. He's here. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Verse 13, Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Jesus referred to John the Baptist as Elijah. Just because John the Baptist said, nope, I'm not, that's not me, doesn't mean it wasn't so. Because Jesus said it was. I well, want you, but I'm going to believe what Jesus said about he, him already being come over what John thought about himself. Similarly, you can have people that said, well, yeah, this is just, a, you know, we're trying to make, we're trying our best. Humbly to do a good job for the Lord. We don't think it's not perfect. You know, people could still come and, and refine us or whatever. But it doesn't mean that they knew that, no, the, God actually worked through them in a way greater than they ever imagined. And as I mentioned before, turn if you were to John 11, even unbelievers 
can be used to speak God's word. We have another biblical example of that being done. So even if someone were to say, well, these were Anglicans or they had a false gospel or something like that, they weren't even saved, how could they possibly, how could they possibly be used to preserve God's word? Well, look at verse number 49 in John chapter 11. We're going to see about Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a high priest, but he was a Pharisee. He was one of the ones involved in getting Jesus Christ arrested and put to death. He was not a good man. He was not a God. He was not a saved man. Verse number 49, the Bible says, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And look at verse 51. It says, And this spake he not of himself, or meaning from himself. These words didn't come from him out of his heart. It says, But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together and one the children of God that were scattered abroad. The Bible is saying that he didn't speak that of himself, but he prophesied just because he was in the position of the high priest. You remember Jesus said, you know, the things that they, that they teach you, he says, that do, but don't do after their manner, right? He's saying when they're teaching you, you know, from the, from the book of Moses, you know, you observe and you keep that, but don't do like they do because they're hypocrites, right? They're going to tell you to do one thing and they're not doing it themselves. They won't even lift their finger to do it, but they're going to tell you all day long to do it. But he, but he did tell him, he says, well, what they're teaching you to observe, that observe, you know, that do, but just don't do after the way that they do it. Um, so even unbelievers can be used to speak God's word or to, to preserve it because God's the one doing the preserving. Any vessel that you look at, humanly speaking, is going to be imperfect. They're going to have flaws. They're not going to be great. You know, I mean, even the great men of God that we look at that were used to give us God's word had their flaws. They were imperfect. They were impure. But the reason why the words that were, that were given to them are pure because they weren't their own words. They were God's words. They're perfect. They're preserved. Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Another great reference. That's Matthew 24, 35. About his words not passing away, not ending, being preserved. Isaiah 30, verse number 8, is another one of my favorites, in addition to Psalm 12, about, about God's word being preserved. Isaiah 38 says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Just write it down, write it in a book, and this is going to last forever and ever and ever. Jesus himself called the written word that he preached uh, scripture. And we see that from scripture in Luke chapter 4. Turn if you would though to Acts chapter 2. There's only two more points I want to make about this. I know it's going a little bit long tonight. We, uh, we, did, we held communion. But we wanna, I just want to get through this. I'm going to skip over that reference in Luke chapter 4 and just deal real quickly with the concept of, oh, well, you lose something in translation, right? Because people will think, oh, well, God has preserved his words, but they're only preserved in Hebrew or in Greek. That if you want to know what God's word really says, then you have to go back to these languages. You have to understand these languages. Well, that is not true. That is, the Bible says that God's word is not bound. And that actually the Bible says that, that the, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word quick means it's alive. God's word is not bound by any one language. And in fact, God is the one who created languages to begin with. So since God is the one who came up with the languages of the world, I think God would be able to preserve them in whatever language he chooses. And you say, well, when did God create the languages? At the Tower of Babel. Because up until that point, you have Adam and Eve. I bet they speak the same language, right? I mean, they're husband and wife. And their children, well, where are they going to learn to speak from? Mom and dad, right? And the people that continued and populated the earth all the way up until the flood, 
we have no reason to believe that they spoke any other language than the same language, whatever that was. The same language that Noah spake. Noah gets on the ark, God wipes the earth clean, starts new with Noah and his family. They start populating the earth again. They all stay clustered together. Instead of going out and being fruitful and multiplying all across the face of the earth, they decide to stay together in one city in Babel and just build this great thing. So they decide to build this tower to reach up unto God, unto the heavens. Their works-based type of salvation. God doesn't like what they're doing. And he says, see, they all have the same language. And this is what they begin to do with themselves. So he, so he decided to go down there and confound their language. And one day everyone woke up. And instead of all understanding each other, you've got different groups of people speaking different languages. So you just have no idea. Just imagine if you came to church tonight and you've got one family speaking Chinese, another family speaking Spanish, another family speaking Arabic, another, you know, and, and we're just like, you don't know the other language, so you, you have no idea what they're saying. And what they did then is they broke off and formed nations based off of people who spake the same language. So they were able to find each other. Oh, okay, I can understand you. We're speaking the same thing. They would go off then and, and split up because that's, that was what God's will was. And he kind of forced that to happen. So in order to do that, God created, he, he made them have these languages. Why would he create a language at that time where people couldn't understand what God's word was? That, to me, I mean, that's getting into like some weird Calvinist doctrine where God picks and chooses who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. When you, when, if you were to take a stance that like, oh no, there's no way that they could understand God's word in that language. They would have to all learn the same language going against what God wanted them to do anyways in the first place. But then we have the, the event in Acts chapter 2 where God's word literally was spoken in different languages through the Holy Ghost. At the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 4, the Bible says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So are these necessarily their own words? No, it's the Holy Ghost working through them and speaking through them to speak the word of God in a language that they don't know. Verse number 5, And there were there dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, are not all these that which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? It was a miracle of God. The Holy Ghost was working. I think the Holy Ghost probably did a good job of translating God's word into the language of the hearer and that nothing was lost in translation. Not everyone can speak multiple languages. I am not fluent in Spanish, but I could speak quite a bit of Spanish. I've learned a lot of Spanish. And just through my use of language, there is nothing that cannot be communicated from one language to another language. I, I don't believe that at all. Now, you may use some different words or a different grammar structure. Or you put your verb first or your noun first or whatever, whatever the rules are of another language. But you can still say the same thing in any language. It may require some more words or some less words, but you're going to be able to convey the exact same truth regardless of language. And that if the Holy Spirit is involved, if God is involved in the translation, then there's nothing that needs to be lost. And I believe that God's, God was at work through the translation of the preservation of God's word into English. Um, turn it, the last place I'll have you turn, turn if you would to um, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. There's so many, so many areas we could get into on, on the preservation of God's Word and the perfection of God's Word and why we believe the King James Bible. I'm trying to highlight some of the important aspects of it, why we could trust it, and what the Bible actually just has to say about this subject itself. But the Bible refers to the, the, Bible refers to the Word of God as being incorruptible. And just as much as we need Jesus Christ to save us, we need the Word of God in order to be saved. 
We are saved through the word of God. The word of God is the seed that is planted in our heart. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus Christ is referred to as the word. So you say, well, we need Jesus Christ. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Amen. We need to receive the word in order to be saved. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it's that word of God. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh in John chapter 1. That, 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 that name, the word of God, is not some meaningless name or some title that's given to him. It's actually describing who Jesus is. He is the word of God incarnate as a man. And just as much as Jesus is without sin, is perfect, is pure, the word of God is the same way. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22, the Bible says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So there's your preservation. The word of God lives and abides forever. It continues forever, it's preserved forever. And he says, we're being, we're, we are born again. We are saved. Our new birth is not from corruptible seed. It's not from a perversion of God's word. It's from God's perfectly preserved word. We are born again. It's incorruptible. And that's what the word of God is. It's perfect. Luke 8 gives us one more example. You don't have to turn if you want to. It's just the parable of the sower that many of you are probably very familiar with. When Jesus explains, he first he gives a parable and he explains what it means. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 11, he says, now the parable is this, the seed that he's referring to, the seed being sown. He says, the seed is the word of God. And it's no coincidence in 1 Peter 1, it says that, that the word of God is incorruptible and that it is the incorruptible seed. The parable of the sower is a man going forth and sowing the word of God in order for people to get saved because you need to receive the word of God just as much as you need to receive Jesus Christ to be saved. And then the parable, he continues explaining the parable saying, those by the wayside are they that hear, then come at the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So salvation comes by believing. Right? And, he, and he goes on to explain the rest of that. I'm not going to get into the rest of that uh, parable, but the, the point is made. We need to be saved through the incorruptible word of God. And I'll just close on this point. Actually, we've got one more verse to get to, but um, in Psalm 12. If you want to go back to Psalm 12, we've got one last verse. I've heard people say that they've gotten saved out of you know, the NIV or something like that. Now, I've heard people say that, that I believe are saved. But I, I think they're mistaken when they say that they got saved out of the NIV. I don't think that's possible because we cannot be born of a corruptible seed. Now, if there's a verse or verses that match up, that say the same thing as the King James Bible says, as the Word of God says, then it doesn't, I don't, I don't think it matters, you know, if, if it's part of some other book that is, that is false, it's wrong, but if it says the exact same thing, it's the same truth, it's the word of God. That can be used regardless of where it's compiled with. Now, I don't recommend using it because it's good luck trying to find verses that are not tampered with because they're, they're all screwed up. But what I believe about someone like that, I believe personally that, They've heard the word of God. I mean, especially in America today, people have heard the, the King James Bible at some point. They've heard God's word. They've heard John 3.16 unadulterated somewhere. And that word was sown in their heart. And some other believer somewhere along the way explained the gospel to them. And I could use myself as an example because I, I don't say that I got saved out of the NIV, but I don't know who it was that planted the seed in my heart. I did not get saved by someone knocking on my door, you know, going out soul winning. I can't point to the individual who was probably most responsible for me getting saved because I was searching and seeking when I was in college 
and I, kind of, I went to a Christian debate over, you know, Christian versus Islam, and I don't know, I, I stuck around, I talked to some people afterward. Somewhere along the way, though, and I, I, kind of, the, I could narrow it down to that event as being the most likely where I heard, but I didn't get saved that night. I didn't get saved till like weeks later, maybe a month later, when one night in my room, I just had enough and I decided that I was going to get saved and I called on the Lord Jesus Christ and I got saved. And I know for a fact from that moment forward, I was saved because I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. And that's all a person has to do to be saved. And I didn't know much. I, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about the Bible, but I knew that much. I knew I was saved. And somewhere along the way, I had to have had the seed planted in my heart. Because that's what the Bible says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My faith came as a result of that seed being planted into my heart. And Satan hadn't taken it away yet. So people who might say, well, I, I got saved by the NIV. No, someone else probably already planted the word of God in their heart. They just happened to maybe most recently be looking at that book before they put their faith in Christ. But the, the actual seed was not from a corruptible seed. And that's, that's what I believe about that. I mean, people, I've heard every once in a while someone say things like that. But, um, you know, we can't be born from a corruptible seed. It just, it just can't happen. It has to come from God's pure words. There, there can be no impurity coming into, you know, like, as, as part of that, what we're believing in or trusting in, in order to, uh, in order to be saved. Uh, continuing on here, last verse, Psalm 12, verse number 8, the Bible says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And oh, how we're seeing that today. When the vilest of men, when adulterers, covetous people are just being exalted. This is who you look up to. This is who's running your country. This is who your leaders are. This is who you should follow. When the vilest, of, when the wicked excuse me, when the vilest of men are exalted, the wicked are going to walk on every side. Why? Because that emboldens wicked people to do more wickedness. They're going to come out of the woodwork. When you have a righteous leader, when you got someone righteous in charge, the wicked get much more toned down. They're much more fearful for coming out because they don't, they don't know what's going to happen to them. That's why the fags were in the closet for so long, over so many years, not coming out. They didn't have the boldness because they didn't know what might happen because it wasn't acceptable because even though we may not have had the most righteous people you know, leading the country or what have you, there was at least some level of morality that existed even in those people to where the, 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 the most vile, the most wicked people didn't just sprout up and now you see them everywhere. But now we're at a point where the vilest of men are exalted. They're lifted up. What is it that's being promoted? The movies, the music, the leaders, all of it is wicked as hell. And now you're going to see that many more wicked people sprouting up as a result. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for dying on the cross and your body being broken and shedding your blood for us, dear Lord. Thank you for preserving your words in the King James Bible for us to read in English, a language that's been used probably more than any other language throughout history to just exalt your word and to get people saved and to, and to bring people the gospel, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to continue to do the work and to, and to put our trust and faith in your words and to be able to explain unto others why they can be sure and confident in your words, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.